evening. I would like to call the uh, Monday, June 19th um, board meeting to order. Shan Lee is unable to be with us tonight, so I am Sue Flynn and I will be conducting the meeting. Um, I would like to ask everyone here to join us for a moment of silence, please. Thank you very much. And tonight we do have a real lengthy agenda, so I just wanted to inform all board members and anyone else that has great interest. We are going to pull item nine, which is on page 90. That's the school nursing agreement contract. We're still working out some details with Blackhawk County for that, and it should be on our next meeting. And um, so we're pulling that from the agenda tonight. Now, if we would all join me for uh, Pledge Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And I will now have Rhonda read the district mission statement. The Waterloo Schools the Waterloo Schools community commits to a comprehensive system of education and support to assure that each and every student will graduate prepared for college, career, and citizenship as evidenced by continuing education, pursuing a career path, and contributing to a community. Thank you very much, Rhonda. We have come to the next item on our agenda is information from individuals and delegations. This is an opportunity where those who wish to address the school board may do so. Please keep your comments to three minutes or less. Mrs. Arndorfer will hold up a yellow card when you have 30 seconds remaining and a red card when your time has expired. At that time, I will ask you to conclude your public remarks. Please also keep your comments respectful and constructive. We're all here with the goal of trying to help our students succeed. Please avoid criticizing the job performance of any specific employee of the district. Personnel matters are confidential and must be handled through the proper channels and not in a public forum. Finally, we provide this as an opportunity for public comments, but it is generally not a back and forth discussion, especially of items that are not on the agenda. At times, we will try to help if we can with information before or after the meeting, but we have to proceed with our board meeting agenda items as published. With that, I invite anyone who wishes to address the board to please come forward and start by stating your name and your home address. Okay, see no one tonight, so we can move on from that. Thank you. All right, now it is, I would like to put the motion on the table for the consent agenda. We have items a through A through M. And are there any items that board members would like pulled from the consent agenda? Item B, Bravo, and K, Kilo. B and K, okay. Anybody else? Okay, so I will get a motion on the table to approve um, the consent agenda without items B and K. So items A through M, removing B and K. Can I have a motion? I'll make a motion to accept the consent agenda. Okay, thank you. Second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to accept the consent agenda. So we have done that. Okay. Items A through M, removing B and K. Okay. And vote please. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 6 0. Oh, Chair votes aye. So, motion B has, or I'm sorry, <laughs> item B has been removed, and that is the Board of Education approved the personnel items as listed. Second. Second. Okay, anyone have discussion? I was just curious about an update. I know at the last meeting we had a number of contracts that we were going to offer. And I think we still had, uh, I don't know, eight or nine open positions. 
I see we have one more retirement and a termination. So just curious, uh, it's only two months. Right. <laughs> it continues to be fluid. Two In months. fact, we received a couple uh, resignations today, and that's pretty normal. We, and as soon as the resignations are acted upon, the principals, usually they'll send the copy of the resignation and a posting for the job. Mm -hmm. So um, as I said last time, because we don't have to wait for any transfers or anything of that nature, they're filled almost in, in 10 days or so. Um, we haven't <coughs> had any difficulty in uh, securing um, candidates for any jobs other than some of the upper level special ed jobs. Even our secondary math jobs are, are we're, we're able to acquire candidates for them. Um, that's, it's pretty fluid at this time. And I think, didn't we have a high school math and high school science? We, have, we, don't, have, we don't have any science because I've got a couple amazing high school science teachers waiting in the wings. I have a, a math job and they're interviewing tomorrow for one of them. Okay. Any okay. other comments or questions for Beth? If person? anyone knows of any special ed teachers that are looking for a wonderful opportunity in a great district, we're here for them. Okay. Contact how many, how many Beth else? Smith. <laughs> we have uh, three lower level and four secondary, um, secondary um, upper level jobs, upper tiered. Okay. That's Thank good. you. Uh, thanks, Beth. So uh, the super de superintendent's recommendation is the Board of Education approve the bill. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm on the next page. Jeez, sorry. I'm off a page. Sorry. Oh, okay. Sorry. We will call for a vote accepting the personnel um, appointments and adjustments. All in favor? Aye. aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. Motion carried. Thank you. And the next item is item K. And that <coughs> I move the Board of Educate I move that the board approve the discontinuation of student fees for registration and pay but pay based busing beginning July first, two thousand seventeen. It's been moved and seconded. Any questions? Discussion please. Um, I was particularly interested in the uh, pay based busing. What I, w I wasn't uh, how does that change the ability of of those not normally eligible to ride to ride are we saying you can't ride or you get to ride for free what's what's the policy going to be currently the way that we're practicing is that as the routes are set up for all of the buildings there are vacant spaces in each of the buses and <clears throat> the parents fill out an application to be <coughs> able to ride to be picked up even though they're not eligible um, of and that was I was going to look at the number of students that we're currently doing but um, the majority of the students that do ride are free and reduced so that fee gets waived and even though in the exhibit here it says $55 a month to ride we collect in total about nine thousand dollars and it's an enormous amount of administration for uh, chorus department our department to to bill and collect those fees um, we don't anticipate really any change to that as far as ridership because it will just be first come first served and um, we don't add extra routes for that so it's just whatever is available in the routes that have already been created. So it's more of a savings of the administrative part of uh, all it takes to manage $9,000 worth of fee collection. Versus the budget of 200000 roughly for a year on busing? So it's a, it's a fraction of the... Cost. Oh, the busing in yeah, entirety busing is, is about four million. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Close to five million. Yeah. yeah, it's close to five million. So it's a, just a small. Yeah. So it's small so it's available on a space available or a space available yeah. basis, 
And they kind of have a formula that they it, use because they don't fill it to capacity just because in yeah. case there would be a move in or whatever. So they, they do try to accommodate whenever possible. And so there's an application process that they can apply for. And then if there's space available, they will um, take that child on the bus. So if it's a number of children, is it our policy or is it uh, Durham's policy? Who determines if, if too many, if there's five seats available and 10 kids apply? First come, first serve until the bus is full. So it's the first applicant. Yep. That's how we've done it in the past because there haven't been as many, but this may generate additional ones. So Marty and Kathy will work out whether that policy would change. I know that we have other things that we've actually ended up doing just a true lottery drawing. So we will say, you know, turn in your name by such and such date and then we'll do a lottery drawing and notify them. So, um, you know, I'm not exactly sure the, the protocol. Um, what we need right now is you know, to know if that is a, 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 I mean, the policy is set here. So once we know if this is determined, then we will work with Durham. Um, they, they may have policies that they could suggest or procedures that they could suggest to us, but we will work on that to try to come up with the, the most fair way. Well, maybe if to address it, if it doesn't add a bus stop, that might be a, a fact. We don't add a bus stop and we don't add a bus. <laughs> so it has to be somebody going to an existing bus stop. So that's okay. already in policy that well, and that would be procedure, not policy. But yes, that is always so we won't okay. add another bus route and we will not add an, a bus stop. So looking at for the, somebody who's paid at the numbers, $55 a month, nine months. You're only talking about 25 or 30 students, really, district-wide. That, 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 that are paid. That are paying. That are paying. Right. That are paying. Okay. Um, there are others that would, would be under free and reduced, and so we do not right. collect from them. So there would be additional, but, yeah, it's not, so not very many. So reduced is also zero cost on the busing? It's half. Okay. Half. Okay. So those would also be cut? It's not Every, just the yeah. full? Yeah. Okay. There would just be... As space is available, and the nine thousand includes the half. Mm -hmm. Oh, so it's mm -hmm. not many that not pay. Not many at all, then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, my question, Michael, is if we have a student that um, isn't eligible for the bus route and understood, how much would they still pay a month, or they would not pay either at all? Correct. So, okay, if there's space available. But we need to make sure everybody understands that we would not be. This is not a blanket policy. This is saying if we have a bus and there's space available, then a parent could apply to get on that bus. Yep. But that does not mean that we would add a route. So that should not be misconstrued to mean that we will provide busing for, for everyone everybody. anywhere. Um, that, that just isn't the way that that works. But if we can accommodate, there's really no reason that we, we don't do that. So we're not guaranteeing no. busing for no. non-bus riders right. with this policy. Right. Okay. And then as far as the student registration fees, is that again a case where the fees collected are, are more administrative than it's worth? Or well, we, ha we have a situation, it has been that way for years, that we collect less than 30% of the potential of registration. And when you think of all of the people uh, that need to be kept track of in our system. It's a it's a secretary uh, um, responsibility. IT does a lot of work with that as far as sending out bills and updating and um, and then also the principals as far as as they get to upper grades, can they participate in things because they have a balance in a fee? It's even gotten to the point of an elementary fee is still on the books when they're trying to graduate from high school. Um, and there's just some inequities there of saying um, with what we gain from this amount of money, it's not worth all of the work that goes into that. Um, I will say that it does not eliminate all fees because if there's fees for um, extra projects in home ec or wood shop or whatever is is a fee that they're getting an actual service from uh, and fines a book fine a library fine parking fees getting your 
your tag replaced, all of those things would still be in effect because it, it, that really is a control issue that they need to be responsible for some of those things. But the registration fees um, is just a fee that we have uh, levied through the registration process. It basically to help fund uh, the renting of the books is what it always used to be called. But in the process of how we've been dealing with the budget and building up the health of the budget, this isn't a fee that's necessary for us to uh, continue to be solvent. And because I think I'm we just need to plan you that way. You can count on us. You weren't budgeting right. in April, right? <laughs> Correct. But on the stated fees here, for a free and reduced student, free would, there wouldn't have been a fee, and Correct. reduced would have been half of all of this. Yeah. So again, it was one third approximately of the district paying the fee at a full rate. Yep. I mean, that's, that's what you're estimating, because that could change from year to year, too. Well, in the last five years, it has a, it's been yeah. between 85 and 100,000. And it does fluctuate every year a little bit. A little bit, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. And with this, students still have to register, correct? It's yeah. Just, yeah. Okay. It's just the, and we used to call it a book fee. Now it's called instructional fee. But it's the state of Iowa has um, things that are permissible fees for schools to charge because mm -hmm. we do um, essentially have a free education I mean usually it, it that's what we think of public education is free um, there are certain things that that school districts can charge for um, in the nation and then there's certain things that are specific to Iowa and this is one of them that you can charge for we're just we're just saying that um, the amount that we collect we actually by the time a child doesn't if they if they don't pay early on and then you kind of stay on them it's just it just is probably not a, a very good use of our time um, to try to collect the, the minimal, minimal that we do. What are other di other districts doing, or is that any of that information available, or is the it not common? The majority of districts charge a registration yeah. they do. fee. Okay. But even at that, they're differing rates. I yeah. mean, some mm -hmm. charge ten dollars, some charge seventy-five, some charge you know. So it. Um, and some of them offer fee waivers, and some of them don't. Yeah. That you just pay regardless of your mm -hmm. economic status. So. Okay. Thank you. I think anytime as a board, as a school district, we get an opportunity to reduce or um, get rid of fees that are not cost that are cost prohibitive, that we should do that. And hopefully, this will be the first in many fees, because when you think of a free public education, sometimes free is relative, especially when you look at sports and other fees and the school supplies that parents have to bring at the beginning. So. Um, I hope that we can can move to vote on this to to get rid of this fee. And thanks, uh, Michael, for looking into that. You're welcome. Any more comments, questions, for Michael? Okay. With that said, we will <coughs> take a vote that the board approves the discontinuation of student fees for registration and pay basis busing beginning July 1, 2017. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Chair votes aye. Motion carried. Thank you. That concludes the consent agenda for tonight. Our next item on our agenda is, um, let's see, we are down yeah, to 54. page 54, the Waterloo Career Center Architectural Services. I and can we read all that? Nope, just the motion. Just the motion. The motion. Yeah. Okay. Um, the superintendent recommendation is the Board of Education authorized the approval of a schematic design for the Waterloo Career Center prepared by Envision Architects and authorized Envision Architects to proceed with the design and development phase of the Waterloo Career Center. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. And I think we have um, representatives. Uh, Kate and Brad here from Envision, if they would come and enlighten us. And while you're coming forward, could I make just a couple comments to start with? Um, 
Uh, Brad and Kate are here from, Brad Leeper and Kate Payne are here from Envision, and they are going to talk a little bit about the, the Career Center. Um, in, in working with, I think all of you, we've, we've had this on our agenda before, where as we move forward, this is just kind of another symbolic piece that we bring together, and then, you know, to make sure that we are doing this publicly, and that it's a great opportunity for, um, you know, the media is here, uh, Andrew's here from The Courier, it's just a good opportunity for us to share what's going on, and to make sure that we are, um, we are all on the same page. What I asked... Brad and Kate to talk about tonight is a little bit about the process that we've used thus far and we use we throw out terms that you know schematic design and des design and development and what, the, what does that really mean for us what does that mean for the public what does that mean for our school system and then to talk a little bit about the scope of the work the timeline for the work the cost of the work and and then answer any questions that you have so that's really what we're what we're doing tonight so I'm going to turn it over to you guys green button then. What's that? The, the green, green button. button. Push. It says push here or whatever. Huh. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Thanks for having us. Uh, now that you can hear me. Yep. Um, we're excited about uh, being part of this project. It's a, it's a great project for the district uh, and the community. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about process. Over the last three months we've been uh, meeting with the uh, facilities committee uh, and uh, we've had some really great discussions about um, the phase that we call discovery, which is really understanding what it is we're going to do. Um, we had some ideas in terms of the areas that were going to be affected, um, but we took a step back briefly to talk about um, what were the real drivers behind this project, uh, and, you know, and, and what are some of the things that were really important. And uh, so we took some uh, some time to do that. We went and saw some other facilities. Uh, we've done a, a series of tours uh, for um, similar programs. Uh, in different ways um, and then um, we entered the strategy section of the project which is really um, what Jane said is schematic design and the intent of that is we don't know everything um, but we generally know where the spaces are, are generally going to be um, and what the building looks like in, in a broad sense it makes up roughly oh, 20 percent probably of the design process so we're at the beginning um, we're at the point of we're starting to deal with structural consultants and mechanical electrical consultants and starting to make some initial um, system selections and so we're at that point now um, and then uh, as we go forward to the next step as, as Jane said if, if, if we get authorized tonight um, to look at more detailed analysis uh, which involves really doing a lot more in investigation on site uh, a lot more coordination with our consultants and we have our mechanical electrical consultants here if you guys have questions for them as well um, we're really going to be digging in to the details in terms of thinking about okay this wall is this and and the system is exactly this and it's going to work you know there's going to be this kind of mechanical space and it's going to be this big exactly so we have a lot of development to do um, once we get to that point we'll have um, uh, more information to do a more detailed cost analysis at that point uh, and then we'll really be counting doors and and square square feet of walls and all of those things at that point that's kind of another test uh, and then we'll be issuing construction drawings and going through the construction drawing process was really about um, telling the contractor how to build what we, we've all decided was important uh, for the project uh, and then we're going to go through a bidding process just like we would normally do uh, and our goal is to uh, right now receive bids by the end of the year so we've got some things to, to get done but um, that is uh, that is a goal uh, and Kate can talk about schedule a little bit but it's kind of a phased approach in terms of um, occupancy uh, for students in the building uh, we'll have some coming into the building uh, fall of 18 uh, fall of 19 uh, and it's kind of a phased approach so so from a phasing point of view there's a couple of there are the programs that are being offered this fall yet and those pro programs will stay in the building for the most part mm -hmm. um, I, early childhood is not in the building currently mm -hmm. so a, the plan for developing the documents allows some programs to stay put for a while they are going to have to move a little bit so that we can do some work in those spaces they're currently in. So we're building the schedule around being able to do that. For, for example, the advanced manufacturing program, which will be starting in there in the fall of this year, 
will stay put for a while until um, we can get the mechanicals. They'll take a break during the summer. We'll put some work in during the summer to try and keep that program in place consistently throughout. Um, and from a phasing point of view, so those first programs will stay running. We'll add a few more programs the following semester. So the spring semester of 2018. Correct me if I get my years wrong. I really You're struggle right. with this. And then again, more programs will go online as parts of the building finish. And we're working with the city to make sure that we can make sure that the building's safe and that there's adequate egress as we go through that process. Yeah, so I want to talk about budget real quick. We've, uh, like I said, there's still a lot we don't know, um, but we have uh, done some uh, independent cost estimating uh, with our mechanical engineers. Um, we've also gotten some initial feedback from local contractors um, to kind of test those numbers, and we're pretty close to, to kind of where we where each of each of those independent estimates are coming in right now um, we're really going to test that in the next phase but right now cost is estimate our construction at 15.6 million um, and we're, we're like I said we're, we're testing that and we're, we're making uh, um, some options to give us some choices as we go along this process so that's the construction budget did you mention the project budget right so that's construction budget um, project budget be above that which would be um, design testing furniture equipment um, and those are things I think there's still be tests being tested um, now that we have uh, kind of a design in place so <clears throat> so by the fall of 18 fall 18 not the entire second floor will be done so there's room there for six programs plus the ones that remain downstairs. So the goal was to be at nine programs in the fall of 2018, and a total of 15 programs when the project is complete. And that will be the fall of 19? Yes, although it'll probably be, construction won't need to take that yeah. long. But we'll be. We're oh. waiting for programming on the rest of those uh, areas right to be, to be completed as well yeah we're looking for the nine programs for the fall of 18 but then and that was really our that was that stays um consistent with our original plan which i think we said up to eight eight or nine um in the first three years and then we would add those additional six I, I'm, crystal's here too we would look at um potentially a few more in i mean it could be all six of them in the fall of 19 or it could be four of them and then two more in the fall of 20. Um, we, if you watch the, the, um, the video that we released, we said it would be 10 more programs coming over the course of between now and 2020, beginning with the fall of 18. So that's kind of what we've said. Those six programs, I'm not sure whether they would all go on the fall of 19 or could be the fall of 20, but that wouldn't be an architect thing. That would be an in internal right. so capacity. The construction schedule is set up so that Correct. there's enough space yeah. for that number of programs to be right. involved, to be installed. We just don't know necessarily what they are. And I believe at this point, we intend to keep the same standards such as energy and maintenance and um, guarantees on any equipment that are fairly long term in the in the contract particularly uh, I think at this point the base is going to be geothermal the same as all the rest of the schools only in this case it's for this portion but expandable uh, to the rest of the building uh, when the rest of it gets remodeled whenever I, th I think is that the current yeah that's correct and uh, yeah it's good to note that it, the building uh, you know was built a long time ago and it has some certainly some inefficiencies there and there's a lot of, of energy usage and we're trying to do some of those things uh, like Lyle said to set up not only the area we're doing but also make moves that consider the, the, the entire building in the long term and it's equivalent this space is equivalent in size to a whole elementary yeah it's we think we're renovating 74,000 square feet so you know size wise scale wise it it warrants viewing it as a new right 
build yeah, separate probably space. Ninety-five percent of the of the space is existing. We have a new entrance on the front, uh, but ninety-five percent of the space is existing uh, reuse. Mm -hmm. And with this design, you're pretty comfortable with the flexibility that if we'd want some changes to, I guess, the basic schematics, that it would be workable through this design? Yeah, one of our drivers is uh, what we know right now is that we're setting these labs up to be uh, multi-purpose because they really are responsive to um, community mm -hmm. needs. And so we have some spaces that we don't know what they are yet. Uh, and you might see that as a bad thing, but I think ultimately we, after thinking about it, thought of it as a positive thing because we need to design those spaces to be adaptable and flexible anyway. Um, so we're going to uh, look at the systems. Uh, we're going to set them up so that they are adaptable. Um, and uh, we know that some of the program is going to come online later, and so it's going to change over, the t over time. So that just makes sense, and that's a good use of public money. And one question, are there going to be windows added? I know from just for the public view. I remember when Central Middle School, Central High School was built. It was like they don't have windows. That was a big thing, and and now we want some windows. So. Um, daylighting is a key part of the yeah. project, and it's been one of our drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, certainly are making a pretty pretty bold statement at the entrance um, mm -hmm. to give this a, a unique um, kind of look that that isn't just the same as the middle school, uh, and daylight is part of that. Uh, and bringing the public into that space. Uh, and then we're making some strategic moves throughout the building to bring daylight in. Uh, and we're still evaluating the best way to do those. Some of them are windows and some of them are um, some, some indirect light from above, uh, whether it be clear stories or, or other means. Okay, great, thank you. Some of these spaces are also designed for programs that need a more high base space, a more height uh, more larger areas for labs so indirectly we are looking at programs that are going to need those types of, of spaces and we're allowing to have uh, several locations with just classroom space and then other locations that have more room for the expanded programs that's correct we have some high bay labs we have some Kind of medium medium height, uh, labs. height labs and then we have some general classrooms which are meant for our kind of multi-program usage the other thing i like about this design it is it allows the different programs to interact together um, mm -hmm. if one would look at the design with with a little more detail you can see several areas where um, different programs can come together and interact and, and actually work together um, in a project-based uh, environment that i think will be helpful to all the students mm -hmm. in the programs I mean, I'm not serving on the um, facilities committee. I wanted to commend you because I think it's really awesome how we are going to um, have some community space that we can bring the community into these buildings because that's our goal to be partners with the community and get them in there and have rooms designated for that and just utilizing culinary arts with that and potentially having conferences there. And just I, I really like that idea. And secondly, I was very pleased to hear that the disruption of our student content will be minimal and so that's important to me and so i'm glad to hear that was a driver so thank you there's there's still some uncertainty in my from my perspective there's really three key issues uh, one is the uh, facilities one is the curriculum development mm -hmm. program development and the other is the student interest so any of those can be limiting, mm -hmm. but in this case, the facility, I think that's a reasonable time frame that allows mm -hmm. uh, the programs to be developed concurrently. Mm -hmm. And if the student interest is there, mm -hmm. then we ex then we can execute. So that's kind of, there, there are certainly some unknowns there. Mm -hmm. We're kind of in uncharted territories in terms of how many students really want these various careers, but the opportunity is going to be there if there's interest. Is, is that a fair statement? I think it's a good point, Lyle. That, that there's, there's, that's why we, the adaptability is, is, is so critical. Um, but I think, Mike, your, your comment also about how they blend together is that, that's kind of the future of where this is going, a blended learning kind of model.
Well, there's a lot of different types of spaces available in this section of this building because of the high bays and the different kind of ceiling arrangements and opportunities to provide different kinds of labs. It's, it's a good space to allow programs to be adaptable. Well, one more thing. Uh, it's just a very unusual program. I know you guys are used to building elementary schools or middle schools, and, and those are fixed programming that we know. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, we know how many classrooms yeah, we, we need exactly. We know how the, what the size of those are. We know what goes in them. This is a little bit different in that respect, and, and we're going to have to be a little more nimble uh, in terms of how we approach it. And we're, we're trying to do that. So I'm super excited because, first of all, when it comes to career tech education, a lot of our young folks don't know what they don't know. That includes the community. So one of the great things about this new construction is that we are going to be partnering and including and engaging the community so they'll be able to do a walkthrough. And can you imagine <coughs> once those kids get in there and they see this new space and they look at what it's used for, um, they will say, hey, I want to try this. And so I, I think when you, you, know, you spoke about drivers, I think just if you build it, they will come, you know, fill the drains. Uh, that's a driver in itself. And so I'm super excited once we get everything put into place and students will start inquiring, well, what is health sciences? What are the different things you can do? And that will give us as educators an opportunity to introduce students to careers that they may not have even thought of before. So, um, but, but you're right, Lyle, you know, young people don't necessarily know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking forward to I expanding that, that knowledge for CTE programs, CTE career tech education programs. So, one, one of the neat things I see about it, just the way it's laid down, is you know, we're going to be showcasing this facility for all the schools that come visit our stadiums mm -hmm. during athletic visits. We're going to see what is what's this, you know, and being able to really kind of put that out there to other community coming and say, wow, what are doing up to? What's this the career center? And you know, kind of spread that word around. And then, you know, just a positive comment, you know, I know that you look at layouts and maybe some people are out there who have, you know, the details, but there are some places, some areas that are in middle school are getting displaced, but I think it's been appreciated that, you know, the people are being impacted, you guys are reaching out to them and, mm -hmm. and working with them to make sure that they're accommodated and they're agreeable to accommodation changes and stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and the other thing is business and industry will see that opportunity for <coughs> growth. So the fact that we can modify a lot of those, I, I think, from um, community engagement, you know, city um, economic development, especially as we look at economic precariousness with a lot of our groups, particularly our low income, the fact that you, uh, these rooms are going to be somewhat modular um, almost and the, the growth um, perspective is going to get a lot of business and industry I think will say hey you know maybe we want to move to Waterloo because we can <coughs> partner because I know a lot of corporations have that community en engagement piece to what they're looking for so Waterloo is a, a great place to come and, and grow with us I, I can't be too excited I'm going to stop now <laughs> <laughs> maybe Dr. Lindemann might discuss a little bit about yeah. what you what Rhonda had mentioned about um, getting the our younger students um, excited um, in how we're advertising this out to our seventh and eighth graders at this point so that when they get to high school they have an idea of what right. what to look for right I think um, Crystal and m multiple people have been doing a lot of tours and having kids come over uh, to the center to take a look around and then the other thing is sometimes in education we'll call it back mapping but we'll start with you know what opportunities do we have for high school and then how do you um, garner interest at the seventh and eighth grade sixth seventh and eighth grade and then how do you even go back further than that so you'll kind of map it back so that you're having opportunities in elementary that will get them excited about things at middle school and then you have opportunities at middle school that will get kids excited about what is the opportunities at high school so those are conversations that we're having and crystal has had lots of conversations didn't you just do a tour recently for it was <coughs> the eighth graders do you want to i can't remember what grade level you told me i know somebody was over at the center recently on the um, Monday and Tuesday of the last week of school, we had every eighth grader over to do a tour. And so we had, as you may remember, with our TLC grant process, we have a position called career coordinators, and they're high school teachers. They teach part-time at the high school, and then they have a part-time release where they work on career infusion, lesson plans in the comprehensive high school, but then they also help with the career and technical education. So they helped plan out. A, a tour day where we had every single eighth grader in. I thought, you know, we maybe wouldn't have as many, you know, Hoover was the last day we had because it's towards the end of school and it was packed 
full of students. We had close to 300 um, eighth graders from Hoover alone, and then you know like 150, 160, around 200 from each of the grades. So they all had a chance to see it, and they listened to the video, and we really stressed the message of how this next year when you go into ninth grade it's very very critical that you buckle down and you stay on top of your your content and your curriculum and you get engaged at high school because if you don't you won't have this opportunity right. and so hearing them afterwards you know you know expressing that conversation and every single one of them knew how many credits do i need to graduate i need 44 or a couple of them said i want the honors so i need to have this many so i thought that was pretty neat yeah and one thing i guess as a parent um with having maybe a sixth grader just going to middle school, um, the entrances are completely separate. There will be no, no crossover between mm -hmm. the high school students and the middle school students. There will be purposeful crossover. Yeah. I mean, if we yeah. if we're doing something at, with middle school in the center, yeah. then you know. But they are definitely you're right. They are very very unique separate entrances. Okay, thank you. And I would just add if if. You can certainly ask more questions, but just, and this is maybe for the media as much as anybody who's watching this video, but you know, this whole effort really started in January of 2012. So we've been at this for a long time, and I've said this uh, many times, it's so fun to be doing the work instead of planning the work. I mean, for a long time we were thinking, what is it that we want to do? How, what would that look? How could that play out? Um, in February of, of 2016, we gave the public the opportunity to vote on uh, a very fast, rigorous pace of bringing career programming. And, and with that was, you know, additional dollars were needed. And so um, if, if anybody who remembers the scope of that, it was 30 programs by, 20, uh, by 2018, by the fall of 2018. 30 programs so we have definitely changed the scale um, in in its you know right now what we can fit into the building is 15 programs not 30 but you know half of the programs and um, we've changed the pace it's not 2018 it's probably going to be 2020 um, before we have half of those programs so we've definitely changed the pace and we've changed the scale we've changed the funding stream to um, affording it as we go and the reason that we have to pace it is because you have you know you you need to you need to span across fis different fiscal years and so we understand that um, and so we you know we we definitely will fill the space that's existing that we we committed to using excess space and not um, infringing upon the middle school we want to leave plenty of room for the middle school existing students and room for growth we've we've allowed for them to even grow and so we've left enough room there for them um, but I, I just I say that because I think it's kind of good to look at you know the difference between this and what we brought before the public in a bond it really is you know we're, we're looking at 15 programs and a little bit longer timeline um, however I will tell you there are some blessings in a phased-in approach um Krista will tell you that there's definitely some you know we, we, even with the first two programs that we had we had a few growing pains that we were like okay that's you know kinks I guess it wasn't growing pains it was kinks to work out as we launch things the second round is going much much better and so um, you know there you you always look for the silver lining and and that certainly would be one of those so we are very excited about it the scope is different the pace is different but it really is the same work coming forward in in a just a different different format so um, it's it's a great thing and and the <laughs> the area schools the other area districts are, are in talking with us they're looking they're watching what we're doing and we're looking for every opportunity to partner so it really is a is an excellent thing to bring before our Waterloo Schools community. But the, the scope is still 30 programs. The scope is it's 30 programs. It would have to be right now, but we are talking yeah. about using excess space, and there is right. not space for 30 programs. So, so in the excess space, in the existing space, that won't happen. But yeah, the rest of them would have to. We'd be love in, to, yeah, absolutely. Space. But that will require a different plan. This is this gets us to half of the programs, and then we'll have to have conversations about what happens for programs 16 through 30 or 16 through 20 or whatever that would be at that time. So um, this is, is bringing before us this, this number of programs. And I guess with that, Jane, the last question I would have is as far as the 15, six um, million for the construction mm -hmm. phase of it, how are we making those funds available? Michael, whoever would be appropriate mm -hmm. for the 15.6 um, construction? We have that. Um, balance and borrowing capability within the one cent revenue stream so that's 
had to kind of catch up. This slower pace allows us to do that. That's why it was not a possibility when we went to the bond vote. We didn't have the capacity to do all of that. Um, so this just fits this scale of, mm -hmm. of uh, build up as well. And that's why they're seeing the, a little bit longer, lo lo a longer timeline, which will allow us to span over multiple fiscal years. And um, which is working because we're still bringing program before our kid, bro programming before our kids that will engage them at high levels, prepare them for life after high school, keep them in school, and give them a good solid um, springboard. And, a, and so, another mm -hmm, big component of the timing of all of this is whether the save funds get extended beyond 29. Mm -hmm. So that also opens up a lot of doors and possibilities. So the timing of doing it at a slower pace really works with the funding capabilities that are in front of us right. well doing it at the slower pace does will that in the long term cost us more money than if we did it at the fast pace that's a good question construction costs are always always going to go up i mean every year there's going to be so you know um but then again we're using existing building and not new construction for part of it so angela I, that's a really good question i'm not sure that i i know exactly over the span it depends on when we continue to build programs 16 and 17 and 18 i mean it just depends on when that when that happens but yeah i mean every year that we wait we there's there's not only a cost to students but there's a cost to but we're not bonding either in the process so yeah so we're yeah. not having to I think the student, in my mind, the student cost is the highest is, cost. It the, is the highest cost. The uh, a lack of opportunity yeah. this year, next year, uh, as broad as it potentially would have been. But right. yeah, I would add that from a construction point of view, yeah, Jane, you're right. Um, you know, it does add um, over years. But we're getting great value by kind of building through two winters, right. which from a contracting point of view is, is very valuable in terms of not right. pressing the construction too far. Um, to a point where it makes the contractors uncomfortable, which also can really increase the uh, prices quite a bit. And we've seen that around lately. So, right. well, and having some time to build a curriculum on some of these unique programs too. There are instead, there instead are hidden lessons, rush absolutely. That, Brad, sure you are. mentioned uh, fifteen point six. Do you have a number as to what the <laughs> other phase or the the materials that go into the building? Is there is there an estimate on that? We don't have detailed um, estimates of that yet because we're, we're really just getting the plan together and it really depends on equipment. Um, we know some of those well, costs. Typically you know. it might be a percentage of the right. building, but in this right. case, since we have some different um, career opportunities at oftentimes for a specific type of career path could increase costs for those, yeah, that so area. Project costs might be on a project, um, you know, typically 25 to 30% of the construction cost. Um, for those, but again, you know, it depends if you're, you know, if you're buying all brand new, you know, heavy equipment for some of these labs, that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I know that, you know, we're going to get some donations from some of that uh, with our, with our business partners that we're working with, hopefully. Um, and some of those are just going to be phased and all those labs aren't going to be finished out day one, probably, right. um, with all of these pieces. So um, it's something I think is a, the next step that we really need to evaluate that, that in a little more detail. Thank you. And I guess lastly, I would just like to encourage the community and anyone here, as Crystal and Jane talked of the tours, but if you would like a tour to contact, um, I guess, Jane's office or Crystal's Absolutely. office here at the district, and we would be more than willing to take you out and show you what we have in place now and, and what the future will hold for this. So yes. it's just an exciting time for the district, and I think it's... Um, as with our nursing program, it's full to capacity, and, and the kids want it. And so I just think we're doing it for the kids. So. Well, and these drawings will become available to the public at this point so that they can look at them themselves. Right. We did provide a, a JPEG, I believe, um, Andrew and, and the career have it, but we would provide those to the media because we want, I mean, there's there's no secrets. This is a great message to, to tell. It is a great, um, it's a great message, so we're happy to shout it from the rooftops anything further jesse angie lyle mike randa all right with that then i would call for a motion to approve the board of education authorizing the schematic design for the waterloo career center prepared by envision architects jesse and mike, jesse and mike. So just a 
uh, and a vote of approval, please. Yep. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Chair Vosai? Motion carries 6 Thank you. <laughs> the next item on, uh, thank you, Kate and Thank you. All. The next item on our agenda is Exhibit O, and it's for information only. And it is the, uh, a whole list of policies, and Tara is not able to be with us here tonight, but it is the first reading. So it is just basically um, policies prepared by the, um, regarding like a lot of the board committees and um, there'll be about 15 of them and it's the first reading and it will come to a meeting in July for a second reading and Tara can explain it a little bit better then. So but if you have any questions, we would take those. Uh, there's no um, motion that needs to be done, but you know, certainly you could either give them to us now or send them to, because we want to make sure that you would have any questions answered about these policies, even though it's just a first reading. So I. I I do have a question, okay. and I know I'm on policy committee and I wasn't able to attend. Um, but the voluntary transfers, adding. I think it's 5018. I don't know, 64. Yeah. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Voluntary transfers to school outside regular attendance shall be granted to students in grades K through 12 when requested by parents or legal guardians under the following conditions when applicable, does that take into consideration CTE, the Waterloo career? I mean, because will they, I mean, having people from other districts attend that is something that, or does, would they not be considered our students? So it's they so they would not. That would be, and really what we're looking at for students attending the center would be agreements, a, a 28E agreement. So it wouldn't even really be, um, it wouldn't be a voluntary transfer. It wouldn't be an open enrollment. It would be a, a partnership. It could potentially be an open enrollment if we didn't have a partnership, if it was one child, that kind of thing. That's a, certainly a possibility. But right now, like the, the partnership that we're looking at with, um, with Cedar Falls will be through a, an agreement, a 28E agreement, so that we're, we're um, all along we've been really focusing on not duplicating programs there's only a certain number of dollars and so when we work smart and we say we'll have this program you have that program and we can have our students take advantage of that for a portion of the day um, those will be done through a 28e that's a great great question and we did talk about that at policy <coughs> that it <coughs> wasn't applicable to that because of that so mm -hmm. thank you sorry mm -hmm. nope you're fine is the tweaking of the dress code is that feedback from the schools yeah. it is it is actually from the schools but there was a there was a task force that worked on that and brought that forward um, through various committees one of which was SIAC I know that Mike represented the board at that particular committee but there's been quite a few people looking at that um, I think that's on a 67 mm -hmm. and Mike you could help me recall some of the the differences um, probably the biggest difference that we're bringing forward and this is not this is not final because this is a first reading but there was a the committee that worked on this which included students and parents and staff members and and a variety of administrators um, and looked at that and and um, allowing some shirts instead of the solid cover, color shirts they had heard from parents that it was some somewhat difficult sometimes to find just a completely solid shirt so there were some there's some there's a whole line of shirts that have a trim have trim on them a little bit of trim on the collar a little bit of trim sometimes around the arms um, and so we thought those, those kind of things would be all, um, allowed and the state really has some legislation that's looking at allowing a little bit more leniency on having districts adopt the dress code. So um, I'm trying to think what the else. Plaid. The plaid was um, as far as uh, not right. just the stripe, but actual plaid. Is shirts. not. Not. Is not. May yeah. not be worn. So it's really, it's um, a shirt with a trim. I mean, it really is. Mm -hmm. It really was the trim. Um, there was a change to belts for elementary. Um, they, were, they were spending a lot of time getting young kids to try to get the belt on that kind of thing and so there were some there was a proposed change there you'll see that um, um, I'm trying to think yep there was a um, the tucking in was a was a, a big thing and and really what they were looking at is really trying to hone in on the things that really really 
um, are significant or matter. Um, so we looked at the, the changes that you're seeing here really did come through a pretty good sized committee and have had feedback from other committees as well. From what I remember the discussion, um, a lot of it had to do with just allowing parents a little more ability to shop and maybe buy something that isn't, wasn't necessarily name brand, but at the same time you want students to be wearing clothes that weren't making a bold statement with mm -hmm. bright, um, intrusive colors, uh, loud things that, that really bring attention to themselves, mm -hmm. but still be able to give students the opportunity to be a little different without um, mm -hmm. looking like clones, you know. Yeah, so. and, and I think they were talking about broadening what kids could wear because some, some kids had, I know my own kids and, and probably too, sometimes you have clothes in the closet that they, they're not completely solid. So you have, might have something with trim <coughs> or whatever, and so it would just add a little bit ad additional, a few additional options for well, kids. Well, you know, students liked a certain type of shirt, but it wasn't part of the dr previous dress code. So that they would have, now that parents would complain that they had school clothes and then they had right. other clothes that were still nice clothes but they couldn't be worn at school so this is trying to blend those right. those mm -hmm. two uh, sets of clothing together a little bit more and give kids the opportunity to be a little different without um, s without making a statement or being too loud um, that's where they they talked a lot about the plaids and the mixture of colors um, but then that opens the door for a lot of other options that maybe aren't quite the best choice. So they had to draw a line somewhere. Yeah. There are certain things on there too, if you read the, the recommendation, things, certain things did not change. Jeans are still not part of the, the dress code. Um, and tight clothes, leggings, those things were still not part of it. Do rags didn't make it either. No, they did not. Um, um, That's what my daughter said. She wouldn't wear suspenders now, so that's yeah. one of them, my youngest. Yeah. Open toe shoes are still not in there to the <laughs> yeah. So, and probably if you want to look them over further, too, for the second reading in July, we'll have that. So, Anything else on that? If not, then you can bring more questions to July meeting. Tara will probably be I'll here. Send yeah, send them beforehand. And um, Cora had a lot of answers for the dress code issues and that kind of thing. So, um, um, so next we uh, next item is item Q, and it is the classroom interactive display purchase for central remodeling. And the recommended motion is that the Board of Education approve the purchase of nine Prometheum 70-foot active panels from CDWG at a total cost of $32,396. Can I have a motion? So moved. In a second? Second. And we have Matt O'Brien here to explain um, about the Prometheum boards. Thank you, Matt. Good evening. And just a clarification, it's 70 inch, um, so not at foot. That would be really, really big for 70, yeah. but <laughs> I don't think we can afford that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As as the, the board is aware, we have a remodeling project going on at Central as part of Phase 2 CTE, and that uh, project scope also includes sixth grade remodeling for new sixth grade classrooms. So. Um, the proposal before you is simply for owner provided equipment that we are doing outside of that contract um, because it's cheaper for us to do uh, that purchase outside of the, the contract so we're not having to pay the, the traditional overhead that comes when we include that as part of the contract. So that's uh, the piece before you. So um, we are opting to put new uh, classroom interactive displays which uh, those of us that have been around for a while we typically refer 
refer to these as Promethean boards. Uh, Promethean is a manufacturer of classroom interactive displays. There's several other uh, manufacturers and there's several different types. So I was trying to get away from just saying active boards or active mm -hmm. panels or Promethean boards um, because ultimately we are recommending a Promethean solution, um, but that isn't necessarily a given. So we just wanted to kind of use some generic terms. So that's the, the catchiest title that I could come up with was classroom interactive display. So that's uh, what's before you. So the, the uh, Promethean boards, the active boards that are in Central are actually close to nine years old now. So time really does fly. Uh, those will be nine years old this fall. Um, and really they're, they're pretty much at their end of life, uh, particularly when we're looking at a new, um, new construction project. It just doesn't make any sense uh, to install something that's near at the end of life. So that's why we're looking at um, putting some new technology into those. Um, over nine years, the interactive display landscape has changed quite a bit. Um, I would say that the, the two kind of modern solutions that are out there can um, kind of be into two categories. One is an interactive projector. So the, the difference between uh, kind of our traditional Promethean board that's uh, like that's over on the wall, wall here in the boardroom is the, the projector on an interactive projector still comes out from the wall, um, but instead of the actual sensing of a pen or, or with the newer one's touch, instead of that coming from the board itself, instead it kind of comes from this infrared sensor that then senses the touch. So basically the gist of it is you don't necessarily need an, an actual special board. Instead you can use um, you know, a traditional whiteboard or something along those lines. So that's kind of one category. Uh, the other category that's out there can best be described as a giant touchscreen flat panel television. Um, and there's obviously some more nuances that goes along with that. The, the, um, all of them come with different wireless capabilities and um, different software, obviously, that are pieces of it. It's not just one big giant touchscreen monitor. There's definitely some other components of it as well. But um, for lack of a visual illustration, just kind of think of it as a, a giant uh, flat panel TV on steroids, so to speak. So the interesting thing about those two different categories from a cost perspective is the equipment cost for the, the panel route that um, in this case we're recommending an active panel um, but really any uh, of those flat panels uh, the equipment cost is higher than an interactive projector however when you look at the the total kind of cost of ownership uh, in the analysis that we did, and that's included in your board packet, we kind of looked at the, the, the math with that. Um, it actually skewed lower towards the panels, even though the equipment is higher. And that's because of the additional installation costs. And I kind of itemized how that all came out in, in your board packet. Um, but the gist of it is that the projectors, because they're mounted high, uh, above the room have to have additional cabling ran to those that you don't need with a with a flat panel that along with additional equipment that's needed for speakers we can rely on the the flat panels built-in speakers the so projector speakers are not um, large enough really for a classroom so we have to add some additional uh, in ceiling speakers so between those two components that adds the cost of the interactive uh, the interactive projector route the other piece that we don't have to worry about with the flat panel route as opposed to the projector route is lamps. Um, that's a considerable ongoing expense that has been an ongoing expense obviously for our, our current solution. That'll be something that we won't have to worry about in looking at the flat panel. So um, the gist of it is the proposal before you is is developed on two fronts. One is, is cost but then more so just kind of looking at um, where we're at as a district and also talking with uh, central teachers they were pretty unanimous in wanting to try the uh, active panel route as opposed to the interactive projector route and I should note that we actually in our first two CTE classrooms um, did install uh, interactive projectors within those two rooms as well so we do have some experience with those as well um, so basically both the cost but more importantly feedback that we've gotten from staff um, from central teachers and then also from use of the interactive projectors that we have tried led us to the proposal in front of you tonight so uh, we obtained two quotes and are recommending the lowest of the two quotes in front of you, which is with CDWG for uh, almost a uh, th little over $32,000 for the nine flat panels. 
So which of the strategies or equipment uh, differences lends itself or is more adaptable, you think, to future changes? So I, that it's obviously a, a little bit of a difficult question to answer. I will say that I think the, the proposal in front of you with the active panels probably is going to be more flexible for us and there's a couple of reasons why I would say that um, it actually will allow and, and projectors can do this too but there's some add-ons that take it with projectors and it's slightly clunkier um, the the flat panels that we're looking at the active panels natively can work wireless so for example at the middle school level um, for the sixth grade classrooms uh, Chromebooks in theory could actually just wirelessly broadcast so a teacher could choose to have um, Johnny who has some done some neat project or something like that um, display what he's showing on his Chromebook to the rest of the class uh, so it kind of frees that up as opposed to cabling and again um, I don't want to say projectors can't do that because there are options with projectors as well but I think in our tests that that really it, it works better on the active panel uh, than it does on the actual projector route so that's that's one big selling point the other thing quite honestly is is you look at look at um, even where just media has gone or, or the home television route has gone as well you know everything is 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 big screen TVs now if you look at um, you know five ten years ago for example a, a weather forecast was in front of a green screen it's now in front of a, a high definition flat panel so I think that also kind of mirrors where the rest of the world is going in terms of technology it uses as well uh, I would kind of agree I see more panels I do the projectors yeah. anymore at this point and they're a lot easier to work with in my opinion yeah I, I I think that's a that's a good point uh Jesse as well is is you know it's it, they're easier to work with I think because folks are kind of used to that and I, I don't want to completely overly simplify it because there's a lot to these it actually the the, the active panel is basically a touchscreen television I kind of overly simplified it with that because it actually has um, a mini computer that's built in that's actually mounted to the back so if you have an Android cell phone or an Android tablet it actually in addition to being able to just hook any device to it it actually has an Android computer hooked to it so you don't even need to have a computer on you can display you know websites anything like that streaming video directly on the TV with an Android operating system but um, to your point it's it's something that folks are more used to which I th think lends itself to be more user-friendly and, and hopefully having less of a learning curve and the other piece that we had the conversation with central teachers was um, you know folks we've done a lot of PD obviously with interacting with Promethean um, folks are at least used to that piece of it so um, not that there's not going to be a PD need with this but we think the learning curve will hopefully be less so uh, going this route than it would be going with a completely different technology the proposal is for nine units yes sir um, where are the other three going if there's for six classrooms so there's actually seven, seven sixth oh. grade classrooms um, that we are originally said six, but there's seven. Oh. seventh, sixth grade classrooms. Yeah. There's actually an eighth classroom um, that's adjacent to the remodeling area that's also going to be used for sixth grade. So, okay. as we talked with central leadership, Special it did not make sense to you know have one random classroom have something different than the others. So, there's actually eight sixth grade classrooms um, that will be receiving these, and then the ninth is for the classroom that is part of advanced manufacturing. Um, we actually are also doing one of these uh, for the early childhood room. Uh, the difference being that one is going to be on wheels, and we actually, that, uh, that single one we've already ordered and um, started experimenting with to get it working on our network, that type of thing. So that's not part of this proposal because that was kind of, we needed to get one on site to make sure that it made sense in our network before we took the larger proposal to all of you. Thank you. And the uh, nine-year-old units, 
are there plans in the district for those or will they become parts or yeah so the 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 nine-year-old units that are being removed from the existing classrooms will be exactly that they'll be parts for the rest of the district and obviously the the follow-up question to that is what about the rest of the district and the short answer is is that this is a, a great step to see kind of what's next and and help us to form obviously um, budget permitting discussions on what's next for the rest of the district as well well it makes sense to uh, offset purchases so that you're keeping up with the most current at least in current purchases yep and you know also you're not buying a whole sale you know a whole bunch that will then 10 years from now be obsolete so yeah, you, you exactly hit it. We're really, as we're looking at really any technology purchases, the preference is to not have all big, you know, let's do the entire district of this at once. Um, you've kind of seen that with proposals in front of you, whether it's either equipment or even um, network purchases, which we've uh, leveraged E-rate. We really like to see those as a cycle. So it's not just hitting us at once for those replacements. It's a lot more manageable that way. And just, Matt, through the usage of the district, back, I was on the board when we first brought these on, and there was a lot of reluctancy. And now, as far as, obviously, you're meeting with the central teachers, but district-wide, how do you feel they are instructionally helping our students? Yeah, I, I, I think the district has come a long way where initially, as you mentioned, there was certainly a, a certain population of teachers that were very, very reluctant. I think if you ask the vast majority of those teachers that are still around now that, that were reluctant, you know, when we started, um, I think the vast majority would would tell you that they, they don't know how they would function without them. It's just become commonplace um, in the classroom. And, and we see that as well, just with our sense of urgency when one goes down, it, it really is critical um, to instruction. And we, we, we know that that's an uh, important thing to, to jump on and to get back up and running again. Anything else? Okay, I would ask for a vote then. All in favor? Of the motion to approve the purchase, state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Thanks, Matt. Thanks. The next item on our agenda would be Exhibit R, which is the superintendent recommends that the board of approve the covenant compliance certificate for the Save Refunding Bond Series 2017 as presented. So moved. A second. Second. And Mike, can you or James sure. this a little bit? In December of last year, we went through the exercise of refinancing our major bond uh, debt, the $52 million that we refinanced um, <clears throat> to a $43 million um, issue, uh, plus the reserve that we had was required to keep um, under new laws that we were able to use that to help save um, interest cost on that and we had estimated uh, through our um, financial advisor that we'd be a little over five million dollars in savings over the life of the rest of the bond um, the purchaser of these bonds key government finance um, five months after the fact presented us with this compliance agreement saying we just want you to sign this and verify that you're going to do all the things that you said you were going to do in that massive amount of paperwork that goes along with refinancing the bonds um, breath Beth Grobe who's from Ehlers law firm in Des Moines had um, reviewed that request with uh, key government finance before they purchased and they didn't think they were going to need to do that well it's it's more of a housekeeping thing that their governing board above uh, their organization is now requesting that we comply with this and 
and make the promise that we're going to follow through with everything that we said we were committing to in all of the paperwork. So from Beth's point of view, she's recommending there's no harm, no foul to uh, agree to it and just complete their um, request with this. Um, because in all of the documentation, we're already agreeing to do all the things that they just want to have us approve one more time that we're actually going to do. So it's just, it's, it's a red tape. It's a requirement by this organization, not for us. Um, and obviously, we would have to follow through with all of the things that we had um, promise to do in the refinancing in the first place. When we, do, when we sell a bond of any type, there's lots of regulations that go with that, especially when it's a school bond where it's um, there's no tax implications to it because it's, we're a nonprofit. So there's all the things that go along with that that we have to um, follow through on. So by Beth's recommendation, um, and I will tell you that our neighbor next door had to go through this same thing about two months ago. Um, and they signed it and just said, well, we'll uh, be courteous and meet their requirements because it's no additional responsibility for us. So this is purely a housekeeping um, action based on their request that we just confirm that we're going to follow through on these points that have been uh, itemized on this covenant compliance certificate. There must be some liability on our part or they wouldn't be asking for it. So does this in case of a default or something, does this raise the the status of key government above other people? We've already got a lot of safety s safeguards in all of this uh, as far as defaulting. Um, so all of that's built in originally. Where is the, it's always a concern is where's the funding coming from for us to meet our obligations. And all of that is built in already. Um, this is a, uh, it's a little different agreement because normally we never sold to a bank. Because of new laws under this bonding uh, function, banks can now buy this and government finance is pretty much a bank. So they just have regulations that are not quite the same as ours. So they're trying to dot all the I's and cross all the T's from their perspective, just so they feel like they're covered. Our bond council, our financial advisor has already got us in meeting all the requirements that we need to have. So it's just a little bit different paperwork that comes at the same situation from two different angles, two different types of a nonprofit and a bank. So it's purely not anything more than that to just say we're going to be courteous and follow through with their request. And as you can imagine, um, financial institutions are heavily regulated. So I don't see this as anything that would probably be abnormal. Just in mortgage lending, for example, there's new regs that come out probably quarterly that they have to adjust for. So. I think this this being a new thing, there's probably some type of regulations that came down that said to make sure that you're, is for our protection that they have a regulation that we would have to sign that they would do whatever, is would be my guess from the regs that I've had the pleasure to read. <laughs> and reading through that, the bond agreement, it does look like that. If you just read through, there really is no changes, so. Everything on 95 and 96 is the documents that we've already agreed to. Right. And they're just referring to it and say, are you really going to follow through on it? Any further questions? So this is initial that we've signed, basically. Yes. Yep.
and safety equipment as allowed by three of the Iowa Code. So moved. Second. In new legislation, part of the flexibility that was given to school districts was to address this issue of the general fund supporting the activity fund, basically athletics, to help them with the purchase of safety equipment. Um, it's always been, um, I don't know how many years back we're going now, but it became an issue with concussions, it became an issue mm -hmm. with safety of football helmets and reconditioning and how old they were and all of these different things that went on and the district has no choice but to comply and obviously would do that for the mm -hmm. safety of the students. But the regulations in the code did not allow anybody to pay for that but the activity fund. So if we went through uh, a cycle of 50 football helmets needing to be reconditioned, that's a pretty big strain on the athletic gate or whatever money they were raising for that. Well, part of the um, legislation of this year was saying they are going to allow by board resolution <coughs> that safety equipment can be purchased by the general fund. And we would recommend that we do that. Uh, we have nothing to gain by not being compliant with uh, giving them safe equipment and keeping up with all of those uh, requirements. Um, so part of this was if we're going to do it in the current year, 1617, it had to be acted on by the board by June 30th. So um, with this being the last opportunity, this is how much we have spent in this current year. Basically all four helmets, there were some shoulder pads, which also are safety equipment, as you can well imagine. Um, what is a condition of this motion is saying, if something came in right at the end of the year, right before June 30th, we could adjust this amount. And of course, I would tell you about that. But up to this point, this is the amount that we have spent but we need to get it in this board meeting as an approval so we can actually take it out of the general fund and help the activity fund with this level of expense. And we're, we've already spent this, so this is paying ourselves back into the... Yeah, all we're doing is supporting activity fund with the general fund. Yeah, I much like to, you know, we're talking about board technology and stuff there, you know, helmets are on roughly a 10-year lifespan now, and. You know, it, it would probably be advantageous for a beyond a cycle up when we're going to spend X number of dollars a year to replace yeah. rather than being hit all at once to replace. Well, if you remember, if you played football, and some of us that did play football can't have a hard time remembering anyway, <laughs> but that was kind of the cycle of went from varsity to junior varsity to middle school, and you're thinking some of those helmets could be 25 years old. And the, the potential of a concussion of a junior high student is just as high as high school. If, if any of you have been to a junior high game, some of those guys are as big as high school players. Um, so that's what it's kind of getting away from as well, is saying you can't just do hand-me-downs. You have to have uh, a certified safe helmet for all levels of of students and and that drives up the expense because that was and kind of a common practice Anderson, of hand-me-downs. Anderson 
at least one company. I think Adams no longer sells helmets either. So the number of vendors we have to select from has gotten fewer too. Yeah, Rydell, and I can't remember the other one. Shut is the other. So this this dollar amount was what we paid in football equipment for the entire district. Just this year for helmet reconditioning. It seems like such a low amount because I remember I did research. A while my brother turned 29 today but when he was in wow. middle school his head was smaller than the other kids and his helmet was too big i was like i'll buy his helmet so i researched how much it was going to cost so that they wouldn't have to purchase a helmet just yeah. for his small head um i'm sure he's not watching <laughs> <laughs> um but th this seems i'm gonna like call and tell him to cost. look back at the video though <laughs> <laughs> i didn't go back and look but i think this is one of our lower years because I know there have <laughs> been major, because um, we've had efforts where to try and save money to be able to afford it, um, the athletic directors would get together from the high schools and from the middle schools and strike a deal collectively with a couple of the bidders to come in and do that. Because they have to come in and say, well, this helmet is, is able to be reconditioned or it's too old and it just has to be thrown out. So you have to have a credible uh, source to come in and evaluate what you have every year. And, and when you go through cycles where you did 10 years ago buy 100 of them, well, then you've got a pretty high expense in that year. So, so like previous years, where did this money come from? Just different places out of the activity fund. And so michael have just two questions number one that that was part of it so since we're moving the monies from the general fund for athletic equipment does that also include um practice equipment um it's just helmets. i don't it's know that it's any right different now? that they wear we wear same helmets same helmets There's for practice yeah. or okay because it just said protective and safety equipment so right. i wasn't sure uh, about that and also so if we're moving those funds from the general to this that means that we won't have to go up on our athletic Some fees is year. that correct yeah, in good condition, though. will we have to to do that for the upcoming school year i i don't present the athletic fees that comes out of cora's office doesn't it uh, Willie. yeah Dr. yeah so because i would imagine that um safety equipment would be a significant part of the athletic fees but since we're offsetting that am no, I misunderstanding that was not that. the fee that we we offset was not athletic fee it was the registration instruction fee. books and it was not no, athletics. no it's for re registration so it was just like like a it used to be books. called a book fee mm -hmm. so it has nothing to do with athletics so if you there's there could still be an athletic fee unless you have free or reduced lunch so where's the athletic fees anymore? This is a no. No, they. I. I mean, I haven't paid never paid anything for my kids at all. Yeah, there's a lot of fundraising by boosters. There's the gate, the gate receipts, especially for football. That's generates basically so. basketball and football is where a lot of most of the gate receipt money comes from. But a, an athlete might have to buy their own shoes or knee pads or that type yeah. of thing. Yeah. yeah, so essentially there are. But it seems like this might be precedent setting that, you know, we need to put some controls on because if, if, we, if uh, you know, the athletic funds just say, okay, we don't need to be frugal or anything anymore because we can just get our money from the general fund. I'm, uh, I'm concerned about. It still has to come through approval process. Well, but you know, next year it's forty thousand. What are we going to do? It certainly could be. Well, well it just depends it. on the age of the inventory that we have. Well, my point is, why? It seems like uh, it could spin out of control pretty easily, and that there's no incentive anymore for the athletic fund to be sustained well you should have you should have an obvious inventory of in this case we're just talking specific helmets here but you should have an obvious inventory of what age is what so you should know we got you know a hundred helmets that are at nine years old that we'll have to replace next year i mean that shouldn't change it's the only amount that should vary we shouldn't know we should have an inventory of everything we have 
and a date on it. The only thing would be something that got damaged during season or mishandled or, you know, didn't come back, didn't come back or something. You know, the, the, the kind of untangible so one. Other than football, what are the other uh, anticipated draws requests for the same thing? So I think those aren't issued by school. So different sports pay for their own uniforms and that kind of thing out of this other separate it's activity. Because it's not safety. Right? It's, not safety. Like it's, it's not safety. It's not safety. Would be safety. Okay. So cool. that's where the difference is, is if it's considered uh, integral safety equipment for the safety of the student, not necessarily just a new uniform for a specific school. That's... Yeah, it wouldn't be would, a uniform would, issue. Okay. I think and that two two eighty. I'm looking it up because it really is about brain injury policies. So it's safety equipment, and, and it, so the policy is not an overall blanket policy. It really is about if you. Uh, yeah, that's Iowa on Code page ninety eight. Yeah. If you turn the page, two eighty okay. thirteen is there. But I, I'm looking up the whole code, and it really is talking about. I mean, that's the piece of it, but. So um, it's baseball helmets, softball uh, headgear. But there isn't the regulation with baseball helmets that every 10 years you have to replace them all. Yeah. There's, not the, there's not the requirement that they have to replace them. Football helmets, there is. Cool. So does that make them, I mean, say, say the, all the infield and softball wanted to wear the protective headgear. Does that come under? Can they just say, "Okay, let's take that out of the job"? If there was fund? a requirement by the athletic association, it would probably fall under this. Oh, but it, it has to be a requirement. choice. Okay. So, like headgear for wrestling, wrestlers yeah. pay for them themselves because. I don't. I don't know. Some, some do, some don't. I. I think. So this isn't something that we would want a line item budget. For. This is a special special vote for a specific purchase. Well, since this is so new, this is going to be a conversation with the AD. Should there be a line item in the budget, yeah. I guess, would be my next question. Well, I said, we, we should, you should probably get a, a pretty good estimate year to year. On, I mean, we should have that kind of inventory well, control that, that the, we know how many of them do. They know, okay, we've got this money to spend. Let's spend it wisely. And if it's something else, then we have to raise money for it. You know, you're at least, is it going to change much? Year to well, year? that's the, the biggest the other, question. The other side of this is that they're more, not that anybody's ever done anything different, but they're going to be they're more conscious to make sure a helmet is the perfect fit. So that most likely somebody's going to say, ah, close enough. We're going to be like, okay, is this exactly the right fit? And if it's not, they're going, to, they're going to want the helmet they need. So that could also fall into this category of... So what I hear you saying is we're going to end up buying a new helmet for every kid. Maybe every year. Well, there's standard sizes, but if you had, you might have two or three other so, out of sizes. So if we did the math... On, oh, sorry, my microphone is on. So we did the math, math on, like, about what a helmet costs. Anywhere between 150 to 200 bucks. We bought like a hundred helmets. That is like one school's worth of helmets. So we did not buy a helmet for every kid. Well, it says recondition. Yeah. 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 So I mean, in really, the, really the common sizes we should have plenty of. You know, like a medium, a large. Is when you get into the like the little heads, like yeah, the extra extra small head that for a seventh grader, which we have, and you know, to the two XL head that we have some of those too. You know. We, we have more of those, fewer of those kind of helmets really available, but the in-between sizes, we should have. I'm just start searching for the check and balance. It uh, yeah. seems uh, to me it needs to be there because someone's going to say, well, I'm going to be super safe. I'm not going to use the reconditioned helmet. We're going to get all brand new. I mean, that, that logic could occur. So now what do we do? But do they still have to get that approved right. through a through a request process. So who? And if I get a I get a purchase order for six thousand dollars for or sixty thousand dollars for helmets, I'll go to the AD and say what's what's the plan? 
Okay, so why are the we gate. doing this? Here the gate. We keeper. do that with every purchase. Every purchase uh-huh. has a protocol, and so yeah. when they file their requisition for right. purchase, it goes to the building principal, then it goes to the next one, and then it goes to. It. So there's a there's a pr- procedure ending yeah. with with Michael's mm-hmm. office. So every that's not just this purchase. That's every purchase. Okay. I think I think on the middle school level, I think we are at least all using the same color helmets now. I think. I think all four middle schools should use so that, that Which that, would help with. Yeah, because he got some flexibility to trade across toy between the yeah. schools. Yeah. And if we're not, we should be. I mean, it's really yeah. for middle school football, a uh, uh, you know, white helmet is fine for. Any other questions then? Okay, I will ask for a vote then to approve that recommendation. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Chair votes aye. Motion carries six zero. And our last motion or action item would be on Exhibit T. And the superintendent's recommendation is that the Board of Education approve the quote recommended by the District Insurance Committee to participate in the IASB safety group plan with a total estimated premium of one million ninety five thousand eight hundred and forty seven dollars as presented. Give it a second. Second. Thank you. And again, back to you, Michael. Just to remind you that we do have an we do have an insurance committee uh, that is made up of of uh, three people in the district: myself and Mickey Waskat from HR. Um, one of my assistants, Deb Jacobs, and then there is representatives from um, United Heartland. Um, no, that's not the right one. The auto insurance, and now it just sca- escaped me. And um, PDCM insurance uh, that handles the EMC. Um, but they also. Um, on an annual basis review the other options that are out there we have had uh, a company in the last uh, a self-funded company in the last five years trying to get a foothold in Iowa and we have um, examined that every year uh, listened to their presentations um, but going by the expertise of our insurance committee uh, it's just basically they're not big enough to handle our risk yet. Their reserves and and the intricacy of all their coverages are just not there yet. And it's just not worth um, the change to go with something that is not established <laughs> as EMC is. Um, if you look at page 100, um, you can see what the rates were in the last uh, two years before this year's bid. And it's only going up $8,400, $8,500. So it's less than 1%. And one of the biggest components in that and uh, is really a driver of the insurance because as far as uh, liability damage property damage claims automobile damage claims we're actually very low our biggest risk is workers comp and you can imagine that and you would think oh well yeah cooks that are handling uh, hot things and sharp equipment and custodians that are doing a lot of manual labor and working with tools they have a lot of risk, but really the highest risk that we currently have is staff that have to deal with unruly students of, of holding them correctly, of restraining, of dealing with uh, emotions that are out of control. So when we look at where we are on the workers comp which is the line right above the bottom line Mickey Waskat and the whole HR department 
have spent an enormous amount of time to evaluate, change, train, and follow through on everything. I know even in negotiations, we've changed some language of getting people back to work quickly and so on. Um, but this is the 10th year in a row that our workers' comp premium has gone down. It's phenomenal. We've gone from one of the worst districts in the state to one of the better ones. So from that standpoint, that's one of the key components that have really helped control um, our property liability insurance. Um, if you look at all the other categories, I mean, they've gone up a couple of thousand dollars in, in certain cases, but in comparison to a million dollar policy, it's basically staying flat. So for us to go another year and be at less than 1%, it's not just because of the market. It's not just because we're choosing wisely on deductibles, which we're trying to do, but workers' comp is one of the biggest things that, that is holding us in check. And we've had uh, less claims, and that's why the rate is going down, is because we've had less claims? The claims have been about the same, but the severity of the claims have come down. The costs that we're doing per claim, because part of that is we're getting people back to work faster than just saying, okay, if you're, a, if you're a custodian, you can't come back until you do full, you can do full custodial duties. Well, that's not the case anymore. They can come back and do something intermediate and get them back to work. So those are a lot of things that have happened uh, in the process of trying to control all of this. Um, I did want to say as well that this is, these are the funds that come out of the management fund. So it's not an effect on the general, general fund. It comes out of management fund 22. Um, and we've also, because we're part of this program, that it's an EMC program with the school board association uh, kind of overseeing it and helping to manage uh, the cooperation of it. Um, in the last school year, we got a rebate refund back of just about 46,000. And in 2015, it was just over 40,000. So even with our um, frequency of claims, we've also gotten a break back at the end of the year. So the, the quality of the program, the coverages, um, the people that we're working with and the ongoing, um, the ongoing reaction to whether it's workers' comp or making corrections on um, confidentiality and social media or um, all the things that go on that put the district at risk. Um, we have a lot of confidence in this plan. We have a lot of confidence in this company. Um, and as long as we are continuing to see this success, um, that is the insurance committee's recommendation that we continue with them for 1718. And we are always open to looking at whatever else comes, comes along, but right now there isn't anything else to compare. Is uh, slipping on the ice in the parking lot and breaking your arm, is that workman's comp? If it's an employee, yes. Do we have, uh, what's the, what's, you listed the main category, what are the next highest categories? For, in, for claims? Yeah. Uh, that's not my area to keep track of, I'm not sure. Okay, just curious. I know Bev's thinking, but I can't think of what that would be. Um, I think there are some falls. Um, typically it's with maintenance staff, um, but I, I think Michael's right. We've, we've had some considerable um, concerns around um, working with students. 
um, I think we're getting so much better at, at managing those claims. And we also get more information because we, we've got cameras everywhere so we can see the incident. Typically, there's not an incident that doesn't happen on our campus that we can't see. Mm -hmm. So we can look at the incident, we can analyze it, we can work with the, with the um, employee if it's uh, something that they may be able to do differently. Um, we, we're on those claims and the management individually of each one of those claims to get the individual back to work as quickly as possible has, has changed the face of our uh, workman's comp claims. Yeah, it really is a, uh, a testament to that process when the number of claims we have are almost the same every year. But the amount of money we spend for that claim and how long they're out of work have both been reduced significantly. And it's driving our experience mod down that you, it's just basically saying how severe are the claims that you're getting. Uh, so that's where we're seeing the improvement. So there is a lot of work behind the scenes that, d that deals with all of those individual cases. I'm just wondering if it would be worthwhile to have someone look at the data and as we're designing especially the front entrance at the career center with lots of steps and ramps and so forth if 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 just out of curiosity if if that's worth a, a review in terms of safety work they're comp. very well aware of what we're doing uh, and kind of getting a heads up on saying, well, what programs are going to go in there and what's that all going to entail and what's the risk yeah. to the staff? And mm -hmm. so they are uh, working on that. Okay. They have a safety person actually that works for them. So that might be a, a possibility to engage them mm -hmm. in, that pro in that planning process as well. And just what is professional liability, Michael? What does that cover? Do you want to answer that, Bev? <laughs> um, it can cover um, something happening um, in the workplace to a, a student that might be considered the, false, the uh, fault of a professional. It's liability. It's professional liability. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? What? So allowing someone to use a saw that they weren't <laughs> trained on, I or mean, would that come in? That, that would come, come in. Um, uh, failing to provide proper supervision okay. would be probably the number one. Okay. Are we good to go then? Any more questions? All that in favor? Aye. 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 I just want to direct your attention to page 114 and I've spent a little time in the last couple of months of dealing with some of the specifics of certain uh, how much revenue is coming in each each uh, area and uh, how expenditures are divided out and we are one board meeting away from seeing a complete year so rather than getting into some of those things tonight, I'd just like to uh, validate my point that as you look at the graphs on 114, especially the general fund, we've got a higher cash balance, uh, solvency ratio. Um, it really is an issue that our revenues are coming in as strong as we uh, projected and our expenditures have been a little bit less than that so we've got a little stronger position but i'll uh, add to that thank goodness because six months from now when legislature is starting to get back together and we're hearing about 
budget shortfalls at the state, money not coming in as fast as possible, where are they going to come out? And if we are following through with low uh, new money for a year or two years or three years, uh, we need to be in a good financial situation, and we are right now. But we are going to have to plan carefully. And I think all of us in a leadership position understand that, of saying there's not just our needs, but what is the state going through, and we have to plan accordingly. So um, I'd like to just leave it at that right now as, until we get done with the year and we can go into a little more detail. Um, but the management fund that's the second one down, you can see that that's, stays about level. That's what we just paid the million dollars for. Of, and that's the majority of that, what that fund pays for in a year, is that million dollars that you just approved. Um, the sales tax fund, that's uh, the whole issue that you're dealing with, the CTE project. And the PEPL fund is, is uh, basically cruising along at the level that we expected it and the five-year plan that we put together for projects. So we're living within that uh, outline as well. So uh, it's a, definitely an issue of keeping your eyes on 10 things at once and understanding where things are coming from and planning accordingly. But I feel like there's a very good understanding of where we're at and that we can weather whether the state situation and, and act accordingly. Any questions for Michael? No, okay. I just, I'm, I have a lot of confidence in our financial department and I think we're, not all districts do, so we're fortunate. Thank you, Michael. Well, it's not, just the finance department because the finance department is the whole cabinet that's sitting here the DLT team that decides what direction is and how fast we go and what we can add and yep. what we may have to subtract so it's really an understanding of everybody saying here's what we've got to work with well, I think we have a great team so we Bud's do. there I just have a couple things and actually Charles and just old, I'm gonna do one but then um, if you would just share a couple things about the Cedar Valley reads and the summer and the summer slide if you would would you be willing to do that just kind of some of the things that are going on and um, what would we want our parents to know about all the events but um, my only uh, my only thing reminder is I'm getting um, a lot of phone calls and, and actually people talking to me in person about events for next year and what the calendar says and so I'm just wanted to publicly remind everybody and maybe um, Andrew can even include it in his article, but um, we the calendars are out, they're posted. S school for Everyone starts on August 24th, and, and I know that there are so many people that are trying to plan ahead. Um, I've had questions about Thanksgiving, I had a question about graduation dates, and those are all posted. And so people, I know because we're planners and we wanna plan ahead, so I just remind people that that, that calendar did was approved by the board, it is posted go to it and look at it so that you can plan your your agenda um you know we had we at the last time when we approved that we actually listed the features of the calendar like the day off before thanksgiving um coming back on january 3rd um, conferences in october and february and then graduation dates and that kind of thing so i just wanted to drive people to that and then charles can i just have you just so what's going on with the cedar valley reads piece um mr hannah who's been uh, mm -hmm. our director of elementary uh education has taken really um, the leadership working with the Cedar Valley Reading Committee and have done great work. They've out at Waterloo Days um, and we are attempting to reach as many of our parents, our families, and our students we can with a, a broader approach to uh, engaging reading in our community. Um, summer school and, and I think historically has has been one of our means to stop the summer slide. But what we're finding is that our students are not reading as much as we would like to do during the summer programs. 
Uh, now, I will say that our hip hop literacy program this summer has started off very strong. Um, but typically, uh, summer school does not engage our readers. So, uh, Mr. Hanna and um, the City of Valley readers have done a great job of going out there and have a number of events coming up that I just don't have in front of me right now. Well, I actually do. And we can drive people Excellent. to that. The, I mean, there's too many to possibly list, but I just, you know, from the Ed Services side, I know you guys have worked so hard on the summer slide and the impact that it plays on when kids come back to us in a short two months. Yeah. I mean, and, and you know, I think <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the real critical factor here is that it's just two months, mm -hmm. but that's a huge time. Yes. Um, and sometimes we create this chasm uh, between what our young people do during the school year and what they don't do during mm -hmm. the summer hours. Yep. And um, again, I, I just can't say enough about our relationships with also the Y mm -hmm. and um, how we are supporting their activities day in and day out. Right. Thank you so much for that. And the um, Cedar Valley Reads, cedarvalleyreaders.org is the website. And you can also go to Cedar Valley Reads. It looks like their link. Um, there's hashtag Cedar Valley Reads, and you can look at a variety of things. I just looked at the next events. It, um, t and this is, since it's Cedar Valley, there's all kinds of things in Cedar Falls and Waterloo. There was an insect zoo this this morning. Um, Dan Wardell is, is in the area. There's a Lego lab. There's something called a rope warrior. I don't know what that is picture books books and puppets at the grout those are all things that are just this week alone so i mean there's two three four events every week so i would just parents please please look at that it, it is just as dr mcnulty said it is just critical that that kids read it actually says 20 minute 20 minutes of daily reading can prevent the summer learning loss and so i know i've got young readers at home and um, it, we're reading every day as well so take some discipline on all our parts because we all kind of punch out a little bit sometimes, but it's really important. So, thank you. Now we'll move on to the information from board members. And tonight I'm going to start with Mike Kinji. We'll go with um, the middle on this side. Thank you. Dr. Lindemann reminded me of uh, the high school calendar, or the calendar in general. And it reminded me of some issues we've had with uh, the high school calendars in that in the past they have always included um, dates and um, times of specific events within each high school and that was kind of dropped for a couple of years so I would hope that the, the uh, principals and whoever is putting that high school calendar together could uh, be sure to take a good look at, at what the high school is doing it helps the students to know what activities are going on during the school year, and hopefully we can get that included in that in that high school calendar. In the in the planner you're the talking planner, about yes. too. Um, yeah, we we've addressed that, and I would also tell you that if you go to our website on the very first thing, there's a thing that says calendars, and they click on that, and that has a calendar for every single building and our district as a whole. So. Um, there's all kinds of events and sometimes if I find myself it doesn't happen very often on, on a Friday night thinking gosh what should we do I will go to that and say what's going on in our schools you know who's having a, a, a fair who's mm -hmm. having you know whatever so it's a, a good thing to do that's a that's great that we have that technology we can do mm -hmm. those kinds of things now that a few years right. ago Matt would agree that we weren't didn't have that ability right. so and then on a, another note um, I just wanted to let you know I uh, was elected in 2006. I've uh, been a board member for about two and a half terms. I was off for a couple of years uh, around 2010 and 11 and then uh, re-elected. I've chosen not to uh, run for re-election this coming term in September. So District 1 is going to be uh, open for uh, someone to run in that position I would hope that uh, someone that lives in that area um, which would include Northeastern uh, Waterloo Raymond Evansdale Elk Run Heights uh, and Gilbertville and some other rural areas um, are included in that district uh, first district so um, I would encourage anyone in that uh, attendance area uh, that lives in that attendance area um, consider um, running for this position um, it's very uh, enlightening um, and humbling and um, I've enjoyed the time I've spent but uh, with my children being out of school now out of high school uh, and out of the district uh, 
I feel it's maybe time for uh, some other parent or s person um, from that part of the of town to uh, to take over in, in my position. Um, it's kind of funny. There was an article in the Courier this last Sunday about obesity, and that was something that I uh, uh, took on when I when I started with uh, being a board member uh, 11 years ago. And it's something that's near to me and um, physical activity, wellness, um, not only for students but for staff. So I would encourage uh, any other board member to take that and run with it. And um, we've got uh, some other uh, policies that we looked at a couple of months ago. We had uh, Dr. Lee attended a meeting and we discussed um, recommendations so I would definitely hope that those recommendations are adhered to and and we move forward with uh, those recommendations in in uh, battling obesity and um, not only that end of it but uh, physical limitations of many sorts you know it's not just uh, physical mental um, anything that is going to um, disrupt the education process you know we want healthy students and uh, nutritionally balanced students um, that comes with uh, in, in uh, educating our parents as well when how to give their students their their children a healthy uh, breakfast in the morning and and then it carries through with what we do at our district to allow students to get some um, uh, ability to move around you know get PE uh, be active in school and out of school so that we have uh, they are they grow up to be healthy adults as well so I uh, just would um, encourage anyone who is in the district one to consider running for this position and I've really enjoyed it and would uh, would uh, love to see another parent take that position because that would that's kind of been the role that I have taken on is is being a, a parent on the board um, to oversee those uh, concerns and that's all I have thank you thank you Mike Lyle yeah sorry to hear that Mike um, the August 24th date, I think it's important to get that out there because, you know, every year we were kind of disappointed in our first year attendance, our first day attendance and second day and third day. And it's really important because to, to do a permanent staffing, we kind of need to know how many students are in every single classroom. So the more we can get that out there, I think the better it, the whole system will work in the, in the beginning of the next year. Rhonda, thank you. Jesse. Uh, two here, I guess. Uh, one, just an appreciation I got, and I talked to Dr. Loon about this the other day, of you know, some of the financial things that we're teaching kids, you know, and stuff in class. I was really surprised the other day, uh, talking to my own, my own son about some of the things he knew about APRs and making payments and credit ratings, and we think, how many adults struggle with that how many you know my, my time when i was on in college you know how many of these credit card people have people out there vulturing cards to people to get you know and illegal now. is it okay <laughs> well <laughs> okay show my age here so <laughs> but you know it's kind of you think about it but we're, me and my wife are having a conversation and just listen to the things that you know in one class that we taught and it's like in the school and it's like how much you learn and it's like things that are you know their skill sets to need as an adult we don't usually think of them as you know reading writing and stuff but you know those are traps that young adults can get into and hurt themselves for many years and you know we can't always count that kids will learn that and at home or you know on the job or whatever places so just seeing them you know if he's learning it, i know how many other kids are learning these same skills that will you know, carry them into their early lifehood as adults and, you know, help them make, make more sound decisions. So, so anyway, I just, it just kind of impressed me. I mean, my wife were both kind of, kind of rolled her eyes a little bit because we just, 
<laughs> you know, weren't like we weren't more expecting to hear about, you know, and he added to a meaningful conversation. Mm-hmm. And second one, uh, Wednesday, uh, six thirty at Barnes and Nobles, uh, Water to School alum Dan Gable will be here a book signing for his second book or another book he's got out here. So anybody wants to go there in support of when our alum that is happening. So and there's your reading. Angela. So I know that we have said many times as school board members it's we don't get paid. But I can tell you that I I believe that is untrue because I might cry and I might not. But it, uh, <laughs> just for you, Mike, I might cry. <laughs> um, I got to do this year um, two graduations, and each of them were just as emotional for me as, as any of them. And I don't even have a child that's graduating. I just have had the opportunity to get them, some of the kids in our district through different activities as a school board member, um, through what I do at work. Um, and so walking, watching those kids walk across the stage, and I remember at one point in time, I looked out and I saw um, immigrant families who this could be the first time that their daughters, and they're wearing their proud, um, wearing proudly their, their garbs from their, their country, um, waiting for their child to walk across the stage. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is a great place if you look out into the audience and see how diverse and how real world Waterloo schools are. I, that is the reward. Um, the the pay that you get for being on the school board is it being able to be out and watch those faces walk in and walk across and I'm, I'm sure that everybody will be excited that I won't be on the stage next year because I hug as many kids <laughs> as I can <laughs> as I go through and um, it's just I, I just love it so that's all I wanted to say in class of 2017 go out and, and make us all proud I know that you will um, Waterloo schools is a great place to gra- grow up and um, come back and make our our city better thank you well and I just had a couple things our next board meeting will be July 10th it'll be one meeting in July and that again will be at five o'clock and then on the 11th we do have a special board meeting at 3 p.m. which will be Dr. Lindemann's evaluation. So those will be two um, events we do have coming up. And I guess I just want to piggyback a little bit about um, the diversity in our district. And just with all the um, rhetoric and talk going on about school vouchers, and one thing that I'm proud as a public school um, supporter is that we accept each and every student where they're at and we make no qualms about that and so i guess i'm just proud of our district for um just following those guidelines and and just being serving all and being what we can for everybody and then also wondered for our pre-planners registration dates do we have those out yet Mm -hmm. we do i believe it's august 7th and 8th is it oh gosh see i didn't have it up in front of me um it is seventh and eighth. Yeah. Okay. Very good. August. Okay. Yep. So. Uh, yep. Seventh and eighth. And I'm not. There is a change to that. And we'll publicize that widely. But that actually, we're going to do a centralized location. So instead of parents who have kids in elementary, and middle, and high, we're actually housing it at the Waterloo Center for the Arts. One stop shop this year. First awesome. time ever. So parents can come register all their kids once one spot. And um, so and you'll get a lot more information about that. And you won't need shop. your checkbook. Well, you you <laughs> may if little. you want to put mm-hmm. money in their lunch accounts. Yeah. You uh, bring your oh, checkbook. Yeah. Bring Shoot. your checkbook. But um, yeah, it is. It's on um, August seventh and eighth. Okay, great. And that's all we had. So if um, no one opposes, I would like a motion to adjourn <laughs> this evening. So moved. And a second. Thank you. We are adjourned. We didn't vote on that. We didn't vote. (laughs) All in favor? All in favor.